testing. All right, so um, first for the warm up, here's an example um, that came up in uh, discussion in office hours. And um, the question is the following Which is faster? So there are two ways to basically create a well, if you have two lists, L and M, there are two ways to make it a list that's really like the concatenation of L and M. One command you could, or there's at least two ways. Maybe there's ten different ways, but there are two natural ways to do that, which have different meanings. So if you do L dot extend M, let me um, actually do this in a separate cell just really quickly. If you do L dot extend M, what that does is it takes the list L and modifies it in place, doesn't return anything, and it puts all the elements of M at the end of L. Watch. It didn't return anything, but now the resulting list, uh, oh, I had already run something. OK, so the resulting list has length 2,000. So originally, L has length 1,000. M also has length 1,000. And when you do L dot extend M, it changes L in place, so it has length 2,000. OK, so this could be a useful thing to do. It allows you to go from having a single list to a list that is longer, but it's still the same um, object. Yes? Um, so, does M have to start at uh, no. where a thousand is? It could, it could have started at like 3,000 yeah. to 4,000? Yep, it, M's just a completely arbitrary list that you give there. You can put anything there at all. Okay, so um, this may have come up on one of the homework problems, for example. This would be a useful thing to use for one of them. Um, another way that you can combine together these two lists is you could do V equals L plus M. And what that does is it um, it doesn't modify L at all, but it gives you back a new list that is of length 2,000. Okay, so these are two approaches using extend or plus to going from a list to two lists to a new list that's got by combining them together. Whereas in one case it's really not a new list; it's the same list, but the list is longer. And in the other case, you really get a new list without modifying either of the two lists you start with. Okay, now. Um, you might wonder which is faster. So here's a little benchmark. Let me get this stuff out of the way. So the first one used time it and tested extend. It um, did it 625 times, took the average time, did it again 625 times, took the average time, did it again 625 times, took the average time, and then took the best of those results. Um, L plus M did the same thing. Except it's so slow that it only did it 25 times. The number of times it does it depends on how long it takes each time. Averaged and took the best result. This is 8.38 microseconds, and this <coughs> is 29 milliseconds. And in case you don't know, a um, um, millisecond is a thousand times longer than a microsecond. Milliseconds are much, a huge amount of time in computer time. Millisecond is, of course, a thousandth of a second. So they're really small, but. Um, in computer time, when you see a millisecond, you should get a little bit nervous if something's taking a millisecond or more. OK, so it would appear that using addition is far, far slower than <coughs> extending. However, there's something wrong with this benchmark. Any ideas? Uh, yes, David. Is it printing on the second one? No, it is not printing on the second one. Yes, uh, what's your name? Uh, John. John. That was being extended before the second one, so it's already long. Yes, exactly. L plus M depends an enormous amount on how long L and M are. And when we did the first benchmark, <coughs> L and M, the very first time it did it were really, really short. And so it was really, really fast. Then the second and third time, actually, they're already pretty long, but those timings got thrown away because they were slower. Down here, um, you now have the absolute worst situation where the L is absolutely massive, and then you're doing the addition there. You might think combining together two lists shouldn't depend on their length. And if they were linked lists, which is one possible data structure for lists, then it wouldn't really affect the performance. But in Python, a list is actually a contiguous array of memory. It's, um, it's at the C data structure level, it's a pi object star. And what happens when you <coughs> add together two lists, which is concatenating them, it takes all the pointers in one of the lists and has to um, put them, it has to allocate memory for the combined thing and then put and then copy a bunch of pointers over. So basically it does an enormous amount of work if the lists are long. 
So in fact, this benchmark is deeply misleading. It's not in all the case that L plus M is slower than L dot extent. We have to change the benchmark and do it more carefully. So what we have to do is make sure to initialize um, L and M as part of the time it, which will kind of throw it off, but at least it will be fair. So we could do this. Um, actually, we don't. Have to, we can initialize M once and for all because it doesn't get changed. And then here we'll also have to initialize L. So it's a slightly different benchmark, but at least it's fair. So now we're benchmarking the problem of create a list of length 1000 and then either extend it or do addition. And you can see there's a fair amount of variation um, between times that you do this. It looks like it's almost exactly the same, modulo the fact that the timings are really all over the place. Um, I mean, there is going to be some variation. You should, whenever you see timings, if you see something that's 15 microseconds and something else that's 16, just once, don't think, oh my god, the one that's 16 is way slower. You could easily repeat the same timing and get exactly the opposite. Um, there's a, like that was, right there you see it. Here, it appears that the first one is much slower. But it's just because, you know, whenever you're sampling numbers from um, nature, typically they're distributed in some way and they're not always exactly the same. Um, you have to watch out for this. I've seen very serious people who should know better being misled by numbers like that, where they're only off by like 1% or something. And it's far, they're, they're off by far less than the resolution of whatever you're measuring. Um, this can be very easy to, this trap can be easy to fall into when the time takes a lot longer than a few microseconds to do. If you have to wait several hours to get the result, then you might be more willing to, you know, believe that one is way faster than the other because doing it hundreds of times is not feasible. So just, uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, so that's the warm-up. Okay, and forget about this for the rest of today. Okay, so now let's move on to the scheduled uh, program. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell you what homework three is, and then we'll uh, go carefully through step-by-step -step modifying Sage in much more clear detail than before. Okay, so homework three is as follows. <coughs> Similar directions to before, I just rewrote it to be clear. And now here are the actual problems. Okay, the first problem is, in short, to make a patch to the Sage library and attach that to your homework solution as an attachment to your email. <coughs> this is exactly what I'm about to show you in about five minutes, so um, you'll, but you'll be doing it for yourself, okay? So that's the problem. Um, one thing is I want you to modify something that you kind of care about in the Sage library, so it shouldn't be a completely trivial uh, modification that doesn't have anything to do with anything you care about. So if you care about linear algebra, you can make a change to something in the linear algebra code. If you care about calculus, change something there, or statistics or whatever. You don't have to do something you know, deep and exciting, but at least you could do something. Maybe you could change a good algorithm to a bad one. I don't know. Something like that. Um, okay, so that's going to be, that's problem one. And again, the way you will submit your solution is you'll simply attach a patch, which I'd like you to call my.patch, as indicated here, to your email message. And the way I'm going to grade it is I'm going to simply apply the patch. If it doesn't apply at all, then that won't be good. Um, so, but I'll apply it to the same version of Sage that you're using to make it, which is the released version Sage 4.8. And then um, I'll check that Sage actually works after you after the patch is applied. So, for example, if you just introduce a syntax error, that will not be a valid solution. Um, you can also write something about what you intend this to do. So I will look at it and you know, think about it. Okay, so that's problem one. It's to just modify Sage in some way. The second problem is the following. Look at the track website and find three tickets that in a perfect world you feel you could address. So if you had plenty of time, like your full-time job were working on Sage and uh, you didn't have to you know, finish the first ticket for another month or two, um, think of three tickets that you could address. So um, these are among the thousands and thousands of active tickets that are already there. Um, and as I've pointed out in the past, this link right here to SageTrack underscore report uh, right here, it has a list of active tickets. And so um, you can look at these. These are examples. And um, if you can't find three amongst 2,832 active tickets, I'll be very surprised. Uh, so just, I don't know, there's a wide range of different things. You can order them by 
um, component, if you want, that might make it easier. For some of the components, so for example, porting to AIX, you probably don't care about that. But maybe algebra means something to you. Um, fix the infinity ring. So there's a ticket. So you might say, I'd like to fix the infinity ring. And then you would um, also say in your solution, let me go back, you don't just give three ticket numbers. You have to say something about why you care. So, uh, uh, yes, please. Why are some of these people saying yellow and other ones white? Why are they yellow? Let me see. Is it? Whoa, there's gestures. That's good. Okay, yeah, priority. Okay, so for each ticket, um, so for example, fix the infinity ring, what relevant background do you think you would have to have? Well, you'd obviously have to know what infinity is, and also how it's used in Sage. So you'd want to read some, you would want to see how the infinity ring, whatever that is, is used in Sage. Um, how long do you think it would take you to resolve the ticket? So, I don't know, I might write, well, I have to read some code to figure out what the infinity ring is and see what I would want to replicate the problem. So I think that would take at least two hours, and then I'd want to make a fix and then um, try it out. So I would guess it would take me like four hours, say, to fix this one issue. So that would be my estimate. You might have something where it's, you know, it's uh, implement as in my algebras or something like that, or whatever those are. So um, you might make your estimate, well, read a book on Azamaya algebras, two months. Um, then come up with a design and post it to the list to see what people think, another <coughs> you know, month. And then implement it uh, three more months. So that could be your estimate. Just something like that. OK? Yes? So if you finally uh, some sort of problem in number two, yes. you want to address, maybe just take that and solve number one with that? Yes, that would be. It, it's entirely possible that your solution to two could also involve the patch for number one. Yes. If you want to do that. You might want to do two first and then be inspired to do something in one in case you can't think of anything to do in one. Okay? Um, one of the hard things about two is you can't just, I, I probably should have clearly stated that, these should be tickets that you don't create yourself. So <laughs> um, if you had a track account, you could make a ticket and then say that's the one that you want to resolve. I don't want you to do that. I want you to find a ticket somebody else made and just say, that would be interesting to me. And in a perfect world where I have tons of time, then I could, I could work on that ticket. And I think I could resolve it. And it might take me three months, but I still think I could do it. OK? Any more questions about that <coughs> problem? And then the final problem is just to take another step towards your final project. So um, make a more detailed plan about how you're going to finish your final project now that you, or at least by midnight, will have at least decided what your final project is. Then, And there's a little bit of a plan there, but not so much. But by next week, you, you have more of a plan. And then the second thing is to come up with a very, very short mock-up mock sort of demo in the direction of your final project. So I give a few examples here. So if your final project were implement a bunch of statistics, then your mock-up might be to implement the func a function to compute the mean. So just one little tiny piece, a little baby step in the direction of your project. If your project were to translate a quick reference card to um, some foreign language, then you, would, uh, you could take one of the quick reference cards and translate maybe one of the little, you know, just a little tiny part of the quick reference card to that foreign language. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So just do a kind, just like a little tiny step in the direction of your project, okay? And then attach something or put something on the email which, which, uh, which uh, shows me that you've made such a step. Okay. Any questions about the homework? All right. So now let's move on. So the next thing is to very slowly and carefully see step by step how to modify the Sage library actually see that the modification did something, try out the modification, and um, make a track ticket about it, OK? So um, we can either, so I can think of two things we could do, or we could, you guys could suggest something. So the two things I can think of, um, one is that if you're using the command line version of Sage and you look at the doc string for a function, it turns out that when you get to the bottom, it just says end in parentheses. And it gives you no hint as to how to get out of the thing. Let me illustrate that. Um, 
I've, I'm guessing that many people who aren't people that just randomly bang on their keyboard have probably been confused by this. If you do say, you, you, know, you look at the help for some command, my favorite command is elliptic curve, and you get to the bottom, and then it just says end. I hit the space bar and nothing happens. And you're like, okay, what am I supposed to do? In fact, there's no directions about what you're supposed to do. It's just sitting there. You're like, what? You can hit help and maybe, if you read all of that, which is, I just happen to randomly hit the, uh, the H key, but basically, you don't, you don't really know what to do at all. So it would be nice if, when it's showing this prompt, if it were to say something about, you know, hit H for help, hit Q to quit, something like that. Because uh, it's not really very new user friendly. This is the sort of thing that if you've used, but this is just less, which is a standard pager in Unix. But um, if you haven't used the Unix command line very much, which my experience from teaching this course is that, in fact, most undergrads at least have almost not, have, have not used the Unix command line, or very, very little, which is perfectly fine. Um, then you'll have no clue what to do, how to get out or whatever. It's just, it's kind of frustrating. Um, and if it says H for help, at least, then you're in pretty good shape because <coughs> the very first thing in the help is Q, which tells you to quit. Okay, so that's in fact how you get out is you hit Q. But, you know, it's, we in fact had somebody mail the list about two or three days ago and he's like, what the heck do I do? I have no clue how to get out of this thing. I'm stuck. Um, so that's one thing we could try to fix. Um, another thing, if you'll recall on, I think Monday I edited the factorial function, or on Wednesday I edited the factorial function, and then when I ran it, my edit had no effect at all. The reason is because there are two factorial functions in Sage. One, which is the one you actually get on the command prompt. The other, which apparently is just left sitting around there, and people just forgot about it and forgot to delete it. So what we could do is simply to delete it. We could delete it and then make a patch that deletes the old factorial function. And we'd also want to check to make sure it isn't actually really used somewhere. So those are two that I can think of. Does anybody have any other ideas for something to change in Sage? What do we, what do we exit the node for? After we exit the node for, can do we, uh, because I just closed the, the browser and uh, I'm, I'm still in Sage uh, with the command line. Ah, so if, I don't think that has, ah, so, your comment is that there should be better directions about how to get out of the notebook. No, I got is out of the notebook. I, I, uh, uh, I probably forgot to press quit. Though. Do you mean like when you do notebook? Yeah. yeah. Similar to the prompt thing. Yeah. So you're sitting here and you're like, oh, another server's running. Let me, um, let me kill the other server. So. Okay, so it tells you to type notebook. And now you've run notebook and now you're like, okay, what should I do? Um, it's just sitting there showing you this. Yeah, and, and I close the browser. And you, you, yeah, maybe you can close the window, and that maybe will send a kill signal to some process, and you're not sure if that's safe or a good idea. Actually, I'm not quite sure either. Um, <coughs> so it turns out the right thing to do is hit, to hit Control-C, and then it will properly shut down the notebook server. But there's no instructions anywhere that tell you to press Control-C. So that would be a good idea for something. Um, it would be... Exactly. It's a little tricky because the log could get really long and then you would you'd have to somehow put the directions to hit control C like everywhere in the log. But um, it wouldn't be a bad idea if at least it said in that box, hit control C to exit the notebook server. Because you might read that and then you would know. And the log actually is very um, quiet. It doesn't, it's extremely non-verbose. It almost never logs anything. So... Probably that would be a good solution to this, and it would be easy to implement. Yes? So if you just hit it right now, it'll, it'll tell you, like, help. And Wait, then, if you do what? You hit H. Here? Like, pop, like, a help. Nope. If you hit if H, it'll like, say, name error, name H not defined. If you, like, <coughs> something where you could type, like, help box, and it'll pop up a box of all the possible commands you can do. Uh, well, you can do question mark. That gives you a lot of help about the command line. Um, there's a lot of commands, though. Uh, let's see, there's there's basically like two, almost 2,000 functions available immediately. So that might be overwhelming. But there is a question mark, which gives you help about the command line. Um, so that was a good idea. Uh, my one concern about the notebook thing is I'm not sure whether the function that prints out this message is in the Sage library or in the notebook source code. So let me check that. If it's in the Sage library, then that would be a perfect thing for us to do. 
and it looks like it is not in the Sage library. Look, it's in Sage NB. So this would not be a good candidate. It's not part of the core Sage library. Um, we'd have to change the notebook source code. And the notebook is a separate project with its own repository and stuff. Okay, any other ideas or suggestions? David? You could doc test a function? Which function? Wait, oh, add a doc test. Okay. So um, in Sage, there are many functions that lack doc tests. There are uh, several hundred still. We want every single function to have examples that illustrate how they work. And some functions just don't have such examples. We could add an example to illustrate how some function works. Um, that's a great idea. So, in fact, everyone could do this. What? How do you know which, which ones don't have examples? Uh, well, if you look at them, you'll see that there aren't any examples. But there's also a <laughs> <laughs> there's a command there's an option to Sage called dash coverage. You could do Sage dash coverage and give a file name, and it will tell you uh, what percentage of the functions have examples, and it'll give you a list of the ones that don't. Okay. So uh, if we go to the Sage library. <coughs> Um, just, I'm going to show you how to get to the Sage library for you when you're doing this homework assignment and for the screencast right now. And then I'm going to do the rest, I'll probably do the work on my laptop, but I'm not sure. Um, the way you're going to do it, and this I've already showed you before you do, math480 at sage.math.washington.edu. And then um, the password is fracking2000, no, fracking1062. Yes, that's the password. And then this gets you into the Math480 account. Math480 at sage.math.washington.edu. And then fraction <coughs> 1000. Ten sixty two. Okay, and then um, inside of that, in, you may want to learn the basics of Unix if you don't know them. Um, there's really about ten things to learn. LS tells you all the files. It's basically this is pretty similar to using I don't know file manager or something. Uh, it's just done on the command line like an adventure game, and. Um, <laughs> It's true, it's basically like an adventure game. Um, let me make this a little bigger. <coughs> so here, um, there are two directories, and the directory where you should put stuff is in Scratch. By the way, you can hit Tab. I didn't type very quickly. I hit SC and hit the Tab key. That will complete, so you don't have to type in the whole name of a directory. Can you type ls again? What? If you do it, and there's multiple things that have those the first two letters of sc, it'll actually give you a list of them. Exactly. It'll give you a list. So even if it's ambiguous, it, it, de, it, dis, it gives you a list of um, the possibilities, and then you can type a little more. OK, um, here I have, last time, I extracted this sage install and put it in my directory, wstein, and somebody else named celljm, somebody in this class, this guy right here, also may have done the same thing. What you should do when you do it is, you know, make a directory for yourself and then go into that directory and extract the Sage tarball. Um, and you may want to rename it. So uh, <coughs> in the interest of completeness, I'll write but not actually type out or not actually run this command. So if you do extract file, if you type that tar space XF, which stands for extract and file, and then give the path to the tarball, which you can do by going dot dot sa tab. Then it expands it out. That one command will extract the tarball for you. And in fact, um, okay, I just made a file right here by typing that called how to extract the tarball, just in case you didn't catch that or don't want to watch the video. If you want to look at that tarball, you can use this command less the one whose uh, prompt I was just complaining about, and you'll see the file. See, right there. Um, and then, of course, you hit Q to get out of that. You can also say cat, which will just show the contents of the file. So there's a lot of these little commands, ls, cd, to move in and out of directories. Dot refers to the current directory. Dot dot refers to the directory one level up. 
and then there's commands like less and count. There's about 10 or 15 of these that if you just know those, you can pretty much get around a Unix file system and do quite a lot. Um, there are, of course, many more than 10 or 15, but um, I think it's well worth learning those because you will be able to put Unix on your CV, or at least basic knowledge of Unix, which a lot of people don't have at all. OK, so going into this directory, um, there you are. And now we have our Sage install. And now um, we want to find something. So uh, let's see, I wonder if I. So here's something that I probably shouldn't do. I, I won't mess with that. Okay, so, um, so the source code for the Sage library is in this directory, develop Sage Sage, that has one subdirectory for each. Um, well, it has many subdirectories, some of them corresponding to areas of mathematics, some corresponding to things like solvers for games, um, some corresponding to particular libraries, such as GSL, like a new scientific library, etc. There's one that's all about finance. Um, there's stuff that is related to symbolic calculus. Um, some of the directories are big and full of lots of stuff. Others, such as the one called Tensor, I can't imagine what's in there. Um, I, I've never, I didn't even know there was a directory Tensor. And others have an enormous amount of stuff in them. What? Oh, I have to go in there. Devel Sage Sage, sorry, LS Tensor. So it looks like it has a little bit of stuff for differential forms. That makes sense. So you have all this stuff, and um, let's find something in added doc test, okay? So um, I think uh, what would be a good one to do? So okay, somebody choose a directory, and I bet we can find something out of doc test using this coverage script that I mentioned. What? Common out. Okay. Common out has combinatorics. Um, combinator are you a combinatorics person? Can you define combinatorics in like two sentences? No. Because many undergrads <laughs> undergrads don't know necessarily what it is. Yes, can you? I just told eighth graders this yesterday. What? It's, I just told eighth graders. Okay, can you define it for eighth graders? Counting. What? <laughs> counting. It's counting. Yeah. But counting in much more complicated ways. There you are. Combinatorics is the mathematics of counting. All right, so here we are. Um, we're in this directory. These are the files in the combinatorics directory, and I think we're only seeing kind of half of them. There's a lot. Just for a little bit of background, um, there's a large group of people who developed combinatorics code for Sage. They used to develop it for another computer algebra system called MuPAT for about 10 years. And then um, this undergraduate at Harvey Mudd, who got really into combinatorics, but also knew Python well, because that's like the standard language they use at Harvey Mudd, started porting this entire group of people, they're all of their code from MuPAD to Sage. And in fact, he was so good at it that he convinced them, um, his name is Mike Hansen, by the way, he convinced them are you trying to convince them to switch to Sage from MuPad? And um, that plus one other thing, I think, convinced them eventually to switch, which was that this company called MathWorks that uh, makes Math MATLAB, I guess they had some weird relations with Maple, and they decided to just buy MuPad, the entire company, and uh, use it to provide symbolic capabilities for MATLAB. So now if you'd like to use MuPad Combinat, you have to um, apparently by MATLAB, and then by the symbolic toolbox. So if you're a hobbyist, that's like $4,000. So um, because the symbolic toolbox costs a lot in addition to MATLAB. And that's kind of annoying to have to pay anything at all, especially when Mike had ported, you know, like 60% of their code over or something like that, single-handedly, Wilston undergrad, um, and be, and before he went to grad school. I the grad, the grad fad, but, but wasn't there a special library also for grad, grads? Or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. like for plotting, there's a huge thing. And then the graph theory, there's a lot of stuff as well. Um, in any case, that's the background on this code. It's being very actively developed right now. They have many, many workshops where they come together. I think there's one that's going to happen in maybe four or five days on developing code for this in France, I think. Um, so it's an extremely active project. So let's see if they, um, let's see what funny business we have. That looks pretty suspicious. <laughs> Why is track 12390.patch? 12, Maybe one of the libraries. Wait, was that the patch that we were doing? 
Could be. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe I. Maybe I just left it there. Oh yeah, the partition stuff. Okay, never mind. That was the one we made, so that's okay. So, so let's see if any of their uh, files. Um, so, it's getting hard to read the whole line. So I'm going to do export. I think it's PS1 equals uh, dollar. That will make it so my prompt is very. It's actually a little too short. It's. It makes it so instead of having a very long prompt, I now have a very short prompt, which is this dollar. Okay. If I want to know where I am, I can type PWD. Think of that as you're in a dark room and you look around, and it tells you at least where you are. <coughs> um, so I'm in that directory. And now there's a command coverage, sage dash coverage, and you can give it a file, and it will tell you. Uh, they wrote a file called tuple. That's scary. Um, but, anyways. How about Yamanuchi? I have no idea what that is. It has no functions in it. Okay. Um, tuple. Ha! Score 100%. Let's try the entire directory. Make sure there's... Wow, they're, they're doing a great job. Um, their <laughs> overall weighted coverage score is 99%, and it looks like they need one more function to get to 99%. So round the ears. Um, so there's something in there. So again, here's what I typed to get that. Sage-coverage dot... That showed me what in this directory, well, for every file in this directory and every subdirectory, it gave me the coverage for that file. That is, how many, um, of, it counts how many functions are in the file and how many of them have doc tests. And since it says 99%, apparently there's one or at least one that doesn't, or a rounding error. Um, or it, sometimes the coverage script mi mixes or misses stuff that does have valid doc tests. That has happened. Ah, series.py. Woohoo. Species. All right, let's 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 try this one. Species is in a subdirectory. Sage dash coverage. Series.py. So if you do it on a particular file, then instead of just giving you the overview, it also gives you additional information. So it tells you which functions are missing the documentation, and it also gives you um, some warnings. Possibly something that looks like it. You know, what if you added a doc string with an example um, which illustrates completely the wrong function? That shouldn't count, and this will give you warnings about that. So it looks like there's a function approximate order that doesn't have a doc string. So let's take a look. So I'll type pico, my least, I never use this editor, but in the interest of doing something exactly like you would do it, if you didn't know anything like vi or emacs, then... Um, so somewhere in here, there's a function without a doc test. I think I forgot the name already. OK, approximate order. So control W for where is approximate order. Uh, keep looking. Keep looking. I think there was an underscore at the beginning. So I'll do def underscore approx. Ah, here it is. Look. Ooh. Here's a function. And notice that it has no doc string. Um, See, there's no doc string anywhere. <coughs> Nothing. So this is the one function in this file that isn't te properly tested. Oh, there's the underscore new as well. But this one, whatever it does, is not good. So you might wonder, um, how can we do this? So first, I'm going to create a really simple kind of template of a doc string, since I have no idea what this function does or anything else about it. Um, to understand that, I have to read something in the rest of the file. Every other function is going to have code that you could run that will allow you to make the relevant objects and so on. So it, will, it shouldn't be too hard to add one more. But in the interest of making sure you could do the homework problem, um, and in case things go a little bit slowly, I'll make a template for the doc string just right now, check in the change so you can see how that works, and then um, export the patch. Okay? And then if we successfully do that in the next 10 minutes, then we'll try to do something a little more clever where we give an actual valid doc string. Okay? With me? Okay. So I'm just going to make a template for the doc string. <coughs> so short one line description of this function. Uh, more details. And then typically what we do is you put input colon, two blank lines, a dash, and then for each of the input, actually it's two. It's two in Sphinx. You may have seen it as one, but that's wrong. It'll get, um, it will not be correct. I have gotten an argument about this and lost. I thought it should be one. Um, 
Well, it looks like one, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it will look like one in the output, but in order to make an ordered list properly, you have to have a blank. Oh, did I say two blank lines? Yes. I, okay, I am wrong, and I just got another argument. I was wrong, I was wrong again. Okay, so that is exactly one blank line. Sorry. Um, two new lines. Um, there's a new line after the colon, and then there's a new line. Okay. But, that I can agree with. Yeah. But I did not say that. I said two blank lines. That's exactly one blank line. Sorry about that. Thanks for... What's your name again? Nason. Nason. Well, I've asked you your name like five times now. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm... It's not a problem. Okay. Um, compute coefficients, and then what this is. And then uh, another parameter, new order, what this is, and then another one. Uh, looks like that was star series, okay? Although star series, so the star thing um, in Python that allows you to put uh, any number of additional arguments and they'll all be put, so you can call this method with 10 arguments and all of the arguments will be put in this um, variable called series, which will be a tuple containing all the additional arguments. Um, you can give any number of arguments that way. So it's easy in Python, as it turns out, to have a function with multiple number of arguments. Okay, and then you, um, if there's output, which it looks like, doesn't look like it, what does it do? Yeah, it returns all kinds of stuff. Okay, so sometimes none. Um, so if there's output, you'd say, like a, it's a bad idea to ever use tabs. So output, and then um, what it outputs. Okay, and then finally, most importantly, examples. So I'll just put in a totally bogus doc string for illustration purposes. Oops, good point. Two plus three, five. And I'll put another one, so when we test it, we'll see if there's something wrong. Wait, actually, let's do something like before. Uh, what was it? Um, one or two times three plus two to the power. Of That's eleven, right? Okay. Save modified buffer. Yes. Okay. So now we have. Um, sorry if that flew by, but the point of what I just did was I modified series.py in some way, and then I saved it. Now let's look at what I did. This is where we start using um, some commands that are more special to Sage. Hg diff. Well, first I'll do hg status. What this does is it tells you, it looks through the entire Sage library and tells you which files have been modified in some way. Exactly one file was modified, namely series.py. We know that because we just modified only that file. Next, we can do hg diff, and that will tell us exactly what changed. And it just kind of scrolls by, but there it is. This one <coughs> file changed, and here's the diff. The pluses mean we've added this stuff, and we didn't delete anything at all. So that's what we've added. Okay. Next, let's type sage space dash br that will build sage, that will look at all the changes that have been made and make them available to use, and then start up sage. It's important that you don't do just sage dash br, unless the sage that you're working on, you can have many different copies of sage installed on your computer. When you type sage, um, on the command prompt, it runs whichever copy of Sage it finds in the path, which in this case is user local bin Sage. That's not the Sage that we want to run. We want to run the Sage that we're um, developing in right here. And in order to do that, I've um, I type pwd to see my directory. The Sage that I installed is in that directory, <coughs> and so I do this. This will um, run the version of Sage that. I extracted when I extracted that tarball. So it'll start it up. And now I need to run it with the option dash br. If we just do the dot slash sage. If you, you would have to go up to the top level so that you're in the home the you know root directory oh, of the right, sage right, install, yeah, then right, dot right, slash yeah. sage would work. Yeah, right. Or you could use dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot enough times sage. That would work as well. But probably the simplest thing is to type PWD, see what's up, and then look. Um, apparently, this is the first time I've um, run Sage, so it's doing something involving dealing with hard coded paths. Um, I ran this one before, though. Oh, I think I ran it, but then I changed the directory name to be shorter, so it's getting ridiculously long, and that's why it's doing this. Anytime you move your Sage install, it does a little bit of updating because the exact path where the Sage install is stored is hard coded in 
some libraries. And so it fixes that. Now it's done doing that, and it should start momentarily. And when it does, um, if we are able to find that function, then we would see that it's changed. So let's try to do that. I have no idea how to find that function. Um, My God, I don't even know what a species is. Okay, species dot series import star. Okay, now what is it? Or I don't know what the objects are in there. I have to look at the source code at this point. Um, or import this as s. I don't think I think we have to look at some other examples in that package to because uh, I don't even know what class it was in. I just know that I added a doc string somewhere. Approximate order? Uh, that was the name of the function, but I don't know what class it's in. So how about if I pop over to the web browser? It very well could be. But how will we know that? So if I go to sage.math.washington.edu, home math480, uh, then I can browse the files everywhere here very easily. So for example, go in here. And this way, I can at least look and see at the same time as I'm working on the command line without having to open up another command line. Um, so devel, sage, sage, and then way down here, combinat. And now what? It was in the species directory. Species. And then series. OK, I got the file. Now I'm opening it up on my computer. Depending on how your web browser is configured, you might just view it through your web browser, but apparently that's not what I'm going to do. Looks like I'm using Xcode. And here it is. So here's the file, and we should see the modifications that I made. Um, you know, I don't think there's a way to make this bigger. So this is terrible. Um, how about if I just, does that work? See, that's the thing, Xcode sucks because it doesn't, I don't think it lets you adjust the size easily, which is really sad. Um, anyways, I have the file right here. So here it is, and then somewhere in here, yeah, it's called lazy power series ring, exactly as Ben said. And there are lots of examples of making lazy power series rings. Okay, so let's try one of those. And here's a great thing that you should know. Any examples that are at the stage prompt in any example block, you should always be able to start at least the top of the block, paste those in and have them work. There's no like secret imports elsewhere in the file that you have to do or anything like that. If an import's needed to use a function, it'll have to be explicitly given in the doc string, which is um, good to know. If you are the sort of user that likes copying and pasting code that works and modifying it slightly, then uh, you'll like Sage. Okay, so we made a lazy power series, and then um, what was the name of the function I changed? Oh. Exactly. So it looks like it's not a method of this thing. Urgh. Okay. So it's in a different... Oops. Def underscore. Okay, approximate order. Let's figure out what class this is in. So I'm just going to search backwards for the word class. It's in lazy power series. This thing that I just made was lazy power series ring. So apparently a lazy power series ring is a ring of all, you know, a whole bunch of lazy power series, and a lazy power series is a specific one. So we need to get an element of this ring. Um, uh, there, I made a lazy power series. That is a lazy power series, and now I can do approximate order and look at the doc string, and there it is. Look. It's a short, that's the doc string that we added. So our modification worked. Okay. Um, let's test that our actual examples work. Actually, they won't, but let's test them. And you can do that by doing sage-t. Again, I'm going to use the exact path to sage, to the sage that I installed. Same <coughs> type. And here's what I type, sage-t, and then the name of the file that I want to test. What this will do is it will go through the file, and it will run every single one of the tests. Every time it says sage colon, it'll, it'll 
put that code in a Sage session and check that the output agrees with what's claimed. And that was true for every single one except this one, where I intentionally put an incorrect output. And this also illustrates that this is um, really run in Sage with this, the Sage preparser and so on. It's not just Python code. Remember, if this were Python, it would have come out to 11, because it's really 2 times 3 plus 2, that is 8 XOR with 3. OK, so, um, so that's good. It, the one example is wrong. Now, the last thing we're going to do, I'm, I don't think we have enough time to properly put in an example of this or properly format the doc string. So instead, what we'll do is um, check in our changes and make the patch. OK? So we'll pretend that we actually did everything right. Um, so again, we can see what we changed by doing hg diff. And then um, we can do hgci or commit. I'll just put commit so it's a little more verbose. And what this will do is it will put us in an editor, Pico, and we can type in a message at the top, which describes what our change is. So we uh, added one doc test to the species series file. So you put in a descriptive doc test, or a uh, doc string, save it, save, exit. And now finally, uh, if you type hg log uh, vertical bar more, so watch out. If you do hg space log, it very stupidly doesn't use a pager by default, and it will simply scroll by about 40,000 lines, which can be a little disturbing. Uh, maybe for fun, you'll, I'll, I'll show you what happens. hg log is supposed to show you what all commits are to the repository, and there have been many. So, um, boom. So it's pretty fast network connection, but the way to see just the, the ones at the top um, easily and scroll through as you do pipe more with this or pipe less I, I guess since I keep saying less um, What that does is it puts you in a pager and then you can see each of the change sets And the one that we're interested in is at the very top We can now export it. You can do one of two things to export it. It's change set 16401 on my computer So I can type either the following HG export 16401 or Since it's the very top one I could type HG export tip TIP. You can do one or the other. TIP always exports the very top one. And then I want to put it in a particular file, so I'll call it uh, my.patch. What this does is it exports that change set, number 16401, and it puts the result in the file my.patch. When I was looking at the log, that was the change set number. You could just as well put TIP there. Since you're only going to be doing one, um, you can just use tip. Okay? Um, or you can look up the change set number in the log. <laughs> there, we have now made the patch. Just as before, you can now browse to this location in your web browser, download the patch, and attach it to an email. And then anybody else can apply it. Okay, so hopefully now you can see step by step what is needed to make a patch. Any, um, since it's one of your homework problems for next week, Ask a question on Monday if you have any, okay? Yes. Uh, just let me stop the uh, recorder because it's currently recording everything we say.